welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Paco Calvo. Paco is a professor of philosophy of science at the University of Murcia in Spain, where he runs the Minimal Intelligence Lab, or MINT Lab. He's a leading figure in the philosophy of plant behavior and signaling, a field also known controversially as plant neurobiology. His research is situated at the intersection of plant biology and cognitive science, and is the author of the new book, Plant Sapiens. Today, we discuss plant intelligence and the possibility of plant consciousness. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Paco Calvo. Paco, thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Hey, you're very welcome. Uh, so you have this uh, amazing new book out, Plant Sapiens, uh, that people can see in the background if they're watching on, uh, on video. Um, and maybe we can begin with you uh, quite early on in the book, explore the way that kind of mainstream culture views plants. You know, it's not our kind of common sense way of thinking about plants is often we don't think about them, right? There's this idea of plant blindness that we, we tend to think of them as almost the scenery and not recognize that they're, they're living things like ourselves. So maybe, maybe we can begin there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I, we are far, we are, I think we are far too obsessed with, with locomotion, with trying to find intelligence in nature, kind of uh, look for things that resemble the way we are, the way we behave. So that kind of uh, doesn't doesn't allow us to appreciate the amount of intelligence that there is out there, like like intelligence that is completely different from 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 ours, from the way we are used to either exhibiting it or, or or appreciating it when it has to do with with other animals, like like you know, like might be behaving in a time scale closer to ours. And that allows us to 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 be able to 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 latch onto it. So in the case of plants, it's 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 really really really. It requires, uh, I think, it requires some education to train our eye, to to start to appreciate them, right? So one thing is the behavior. Actually, I mean, we might be appreciating the behavior and still miss that that behavior is truly intelligent so it's two things appreciating the behavior itself because we think they are just sitting there doing nothing rooted and once we appreciate that then we start we have to think hey what does it take for this behavior to be truly intelligent as opposed to simply you know adaptive behavior like you might find somewhere else so it, it, yeah there are some homework <laughs> yeah well i think that the first hurdle right before people can even get to kind of thinking about the nuances of what do we consider behavior is just this, this, um, this common sense instinct that plants are kind of, as you say, just rooted there, they're not moving, they're not like us. And mm. I think it's really interesting the way, you know, it totally makes sense that we evolved to pay attention to things that could eat us or, you know, uh, that mm. might be food. I mean, food that's harder to catch than, <laughs> you know, some, some grasses. Sure. Uh, and so, I mean, I remember, um, it being in a lecture and being shown this this concept of plant blindness and you know you're showing pictures say of like a, a tiger in a jungle and you ask people mm. what what's in this picture almost everyone says a tiger no one actually points out <laughs> that there are trees in the picture as well or bushes or you know so there's sure, this kind sure. of inability it's just they they recede into the background they're not seen as agents right as yeah. living things worthy of, of study in their own right yeah well i think actually uh, that reminds me even in the book in the chapter on plant blindness I recall this this day in the classroom with my undergrads, and I was asking them, "Hey, how many different plant species do you think there are around on campus?" You see, this is a really well curated campus from building to building, and you get to see many plants, right? And then I I, I was curious to know what they thought because this is you know. Uh, um, educated people who have spent a few years on campus so so they, they don't have any excuse not to see it right if you see what i mean and i i got to ask this question to them and say how 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 many different plant species you, you reckon are around here on campus and you wouldn't believe it they would go like you know like yeah i don't know like 20 20 50 the wildest like 50 different plant species trees you know and they wouldn't believe it when I told them there's more than 500, so 500 plus different plant species as they walk out of the building, get to bump onto all them, right? So so, so it really requires what I said about the training of the eye, how to educate your, your the way you, you look at 
your surroundings it's 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 really difficult to see it it's not that easy it's true um, and we yeah. find many many different examples in in the literature of of, of yeah. this problem i mean I, I remember quite vividly when i first learned that plants were alive and you, you mentioned this in the book as well this is a common experience that people can actually remember um yeah the moment they discover that <clears throat> and for me i remember being in biology class as a kid and being told that and it, it was a real kind of flashbulb moment of, of like a uh, very vivid memory of like wow really they're they're alive in the way that we're alive like they're yeah, they're related yeah, yeah. to us and it's yeah. and it's yeah. i mean i think i think that really stayed with me in the sense that it i could it showed me that you can't trust your common sense instincts mm -hmm. you know you we evolved mm -hmm. certain folk psychological notions and ways we see the world mm -hmm. and you really can't just take them for granted so mm -hmm. the average Absolutely. person if you come and talk about plant plant intelligence maybe to some neuroscientists they might have a common sense instinct that no, no way, they're not intelligent. But it's mm. really important that they recognize that that really doesn't map onto that doesn't really tell you anything. <laughs> you really mm. need to go and do the science like you've done. Uh, sure. To look into it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, one thing is that I, I, I assume from from square one, the burden of proof, because I am aware that I mean, one thing is the fact that that there is this affliction, plant blindness, people, we all suffer from it you know to a lesser extent or not but but it is true that on the other hand it's uh, even healthy when you are doing science to remain a skeptic until we have good evidence so in the book what i go through is such evidence to say hey we do have the evidence so that's why why one of the messages i really need to convey and when i give talks i i usually tell the audience about that the very title of the book because they, they think okay i got it yeah plants are smart uh, but but they still think that the title of the book is not literal so that i sort of use the metaphor like plant as sapiens like homo sapiens and they don't quite get it that no no I, I mean it literally this is not a metaphor so they are sapiens in the very same way we are so when you said like yeah yeah it's amazing when you're a kid and then you get to know that, that, that all the things oh yeah they're alive there are living systems like just like us but then if you keep digging deeper you say oh my god uh this is not a spoiler because i mentioned this in the very first chapter right putting plants to sleep like you can put plants to sleep with the very same anesthetics that the vets use to put a pet a dog or a cat to sleep so in that sense it's not simply we are all alive is that we are alive in pretty much the same way because we all belong to the tree of life and we forked apart so our our paths diverted at some point in evolution but when you think about all the previous uh, steps in which we all belong to the same uh, branch of the tree of life uh, you get to think oh okay so if you go to the plant biology, the molecular and cellular biology, the physiology, the biochemistry, you realize, oh, there is no coincidence. We share, we share so much molecular stuff. And we are, we have these molecules, these anesthetics that allow or are able to put to sleep a plant or an animal. So that has got to mean something, right? Right. And I think, yeah, I'm inclined to say that we're alive plants are alive in exactly the same way as us in the same way that, you know, I assume maybe you're, you're a native Spanish speaker and I'm a native English speaker, but we both speak language and, it, you know, it's exactly the same principle of language. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter that the, the forms are different. Sure. Um, so in the same way, life, it's exactly the same kind of thermodynamic process. Yeah. Uh, we, we inhabit different niches, but we're still engaged in behavior to perpetuate our survival. Sure. Sure. And as you say, with, with the fact that anesthetics, you know, if the mainstream assumption that intelligence, uh, consciousness, or you know these things are entirely bound up with nervous systems, and uh, when you undergo an anesthetic, then you lose these things, you know, particularly consciousness, then you would assume from the conclusion from that is that only things with nervous systems, anesthetics can work on them. It must be a brain mechanism. But as yeah. you say, you you just open with this uh, yeah. thing that this demonstration that plants can be put to street, sleep with sure. the same things as us. So it suggests it's something more fundamental, something more to do with life process. Absolutely. So if you go back to the to the idea of, of, of natural selection and how we end up, you know, we solve problems differently because we have different needs and we find different solutions. 
So, so that's the way, the best way to, to get started with the idea of behavior, like to say, hey, you know, okay, animals do locomote, they move around, they have to hide or hand prey or whatever. So they, they need to be, you know, scouting their landscapes, their local uh, environments. And plants are rooted and people think many times, oh, you know, they can afford to be stupid. You know, being rooted, they can afford to be stupid. And it's precisely the other way around. It's precisely because if they are still passing their genes despite being rooted, that's got to mean that they are doing something really smart. Oh, so it's, it's despite being rooted that they are still doing this. So for God's sake, it's just the other way around, right? So you might yeah. say, oh, they, they, they find their own solutions to their very own problems, tailor-made. In this case, it simply means growth. So when you think, okay, animals locomote and plants are rooted, you don't need to compare it as if I was sitting still compared to you hectically moving around. You might just say, oh, whereas animals locomote to find food, to go shopping, to do whatever they need to do, plants reach their goals by growth and by development. So that's what plant behavior is about. It's about understanding those patterns of growth and development. And that's, for right. example, why we need to do time-lapse photography, right? Just to be able to observe plant behavior in its own time scale. Right. And for me, I mean, there was a sudden when coming to thinking about behavior in this way, there was a sudden perspective shift where I went from assuming, you know, this stuff is mainly to do with brains to thinking about mainly about consciousness in terms of the thermo, how it relates to thermodynamics and realized that if, if any living thing, no matter how static it seems, is going to persist over time, it needs mm -hmm. to be behaving in some way. And so even if you look at a fungus that's behaving chemically, for us, a chemical behavior seems a bit strange. You might, yeah. you might not want to call that behavior, but actually thermodynamically, it's, it's as much a behavior as us moving around. It's, and it's allowing itself to keep itself together. And it's illusion to think that grass just has this luxury, this kind of luxurious life where it gets to just be like a brick and it just gets to stay there without yeah, doing yeah, anything, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, in a sense, actually, it's, it's even more intriguing because even the case of fungi or bacteria, take bacteria. I mean, any, I insist that this is not just about plants, it's any form of life whatsoever. What you find is that what really counts is that regardless of the type of behavior that they exhibit, is that because the world is never static, contingencies are, things are happening round the clock. And so that means that uncertainties are inherent to life. So you cannot simply rely on regularities. You you've need to be able to anticipate those contingencies. And precisely, again, this is a case where because plants are sessile, rooted, they have an extra urge to anticipate the future. Because an animal, if you are trying to reach an object or something and you fail, you can try again and again and again, right? So now I can just grab the bottle of water. Oh, I missed it. I go again and grab the bottle of water. But if you're a plant and your means of getting to your targets, reaching your goals is through growth, you might not have a second chance if you miss it, right? So that's why it's so damn important to, 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 to not to waste metabolic resources. And that's another way of saying that their behavior, despite being rooted, has got to be truly flexible and anticipatory. So in a sense, that's something I, I you know, I go through in one chapter in detail. I, 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 I explain that plants, uh, because of their sessile lifestyle, not despite their lifestyle, but because they behave the way they do, they've got to predict the future. They've got to be able to, you know, look ahead. And that's, to me, one of the most important aspects of, of, of uh, plant uh, intelligence or their sapiens resides in precisely the capacity to anticipate in a flexible manner what might go wrong in the future. Right. And this, this kind of whole picture is really... Um counter to the the uh the perspective we've been stuck with for a few hundred years since Descartes of the natural world being kind of just mechanism right just very kind mm. of deterministic clockwork mechanism um and I think it's interesting that we you know we we're talking about plant blindness but there are also animistic cultures that actually find it quite easy to see plants as as like our, our kin and I think it's worth pointing that out that they that we're not fixed in this mode of seeing right it seems that 
I think you talk in the book about um, you know, Christianity seems to have this this uh, leading up to Descartes, this this great chain mm. of being idea that mm. we are closer to God and plants are this kind of lowly um, these lowly things. So, is that is that narrative the one that you think we're, we're breaking with now from kind of Christianity through Descartes in the West? Hmm. Well, actually, uh, we need to we need to do away with many with many preconceptions stemming from from many traditions, uh, both historical and philosophical, and what may scientific as well. Um, but so one thing that really need to do away with, and and even is even closer to our date. Uh, I'm now I'm thinking the mid 20th century. 50s and 60s last century is for example the very idea that intelligence whatever it is somehow resides within the skull right so if i crack, crack open your head i'm gonna find intelligence sitting there somehow right so this mechanistic reduction is understanding oh where, where is where is intelligence sitting oh it's got to be somewhere here right within the head of the subject which precisely is one of the reasons Many people have such a hard time in visualizing, picturing plant intelligence because they say, oh, at least in the case of a human with a head or an animal, I can just try to see what's within the skull intracranially. But in the in the plant, it makes no sense. Where is the head? It's, it's, it's a fully distributed system precisely because plants exploit, evolutionarily speaking, a divide and conquer strategy, right? So they can't flee. So there are no essential organs. That's that's one of the advantages of of of, of their more republican uh, uh, plant body organization, right? It's not hierarchical; it's more republican style, more horizontal, and 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 that's 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 how they go about it. But at the same time, if you can't get into their heads and see who is at the wheel, maybe another way to put it is that maybe there is not anyone at the wheel in our own case. And that's the way to do away with that tradition you were mentioning, right? Um, um, and that goes all the way back to 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 ancient uh, um, uh, philosophy and medieval schools of thought, where you might be thinking that sure, sure, I mean there is somebody in here in my head who is following this set of rules, this set of instructions, this recipe book, and um, by following the steps is somehow achieving the goal, right? Um, um, and what we are getting into, or, or what, what is looking ahead, uh, I hope we we get there somehow, is the idea to the idea that that intelligence is not in the head. Intelligence belongs to the very relationship in between the organism and the environment. So it's like a relational property. It has to do with the way we organisms, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, we all couple to our surroundings. So the way, as an organism, we behave with respect to the environment, to the local environment. And in this dance, this choreography, is where intelligence resides. So maybe the mistake is to think that we need to identify who is at the wheel. There is nobody at the wheel. And that's why mechanistic reductionist biology won't provide the cues. Uh, the key. Yeah, the... I, I completely agree. It's really exhilarating, but I feel like you know this as opposed to the the reductionist viewpoint i think this is kind of like a systems viewpoint where you're looking at interrelationships and again and again i see more and more people coming to this same conclusion i think when you look in terms of systems suddenly you you kind of apprehend lots of properties and characteristics and it all seems to hang together better and i think the perspective you're talking about you know i'm particularly um an advocate of um Kind of contemplative training to have that insight that there you know you can have this subjectively that there is no self that's experiencing experience mm -hmm. there is no one at the wheel it's it's just kind of an organic arising and in buddhism you know it's generally held that all living things can suffer can feel pain including plants so i feel like this perspective philosophically many people have kind of come to this to this mm -hmm. way of seeing the world and i think um I think it's now time for kind of science to put its stamp of approval on it by doing the experiments, check, double checking, making sure that we're not yeah. just just yeah. kind of coming up with um, with ideas here. And so to do that, the uh, you know you the fact that plants showing that their behavior is kind of goal directed, flexible, involves learning, adaptation, right? These are the kinds of these are the kinds mm -hmm. of principles that you you look for to show that behavior is really intelligent. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, definitely. So one thing is for sure. I mean, 
this is important, the point you mentioned about, about uh, first, we do still have the burden of proof. Um, um, uh, second, second uh, it, it despite some uh, schools of thought or, or you know, traditional knowledge are on the same page, we might say, as in, as in yeah, sure, they, they concur, they agree that this is all relational, this has to do with our non-reductionist emergentist understanding of the coupling in between organisms and their local environments, as we said. Despite all that, we still have to remember, and this is very important, that, that it is still a matter of doing this science that needs to be done regardless of the religious or beliefs that people might have. Because then the wrong conclusion, some, some people might arrive to the conclusion that, oh, then you need to believe in something to agree with this position and you don't have to. So this is a, a scientific position that is consistent or not with many traditional or non-traditional schools of thought uh, um, in Western or non-Western cultures. So it doesn't have to do with that. You are still, you still have got to be able to put the hypothesis, the working empirical hypothesis on the desk, on the bench and get to test them, right? So for example, some people say, say, oh, you know now it has become fashionable this talk of of the uh, mycorrhizal networks and trees talking to each other below ground through these connections with uh, fungi um um and people like for example to think that this explains or shows why there is social intelligence which is truly cooperative right so the the tension or the debate between is this an example and illustration of cooperation as opposed to competition. So natural selection in the Darwinian eyes was far too obsessed with the idea of competition. Now we might like to think that it's a matter of cooperation instead. Um, and if you want to do the science right, you don't need to get yourself uh, moved or you don't need to fall, fall prey of your own biases either way. So you might say, hey, let's, let's study each example on a case-by-case -case basis so which is to say okay let's try to operationalize it let's let's do the measurements let's make the observations and let's see what predictions come out of each hypothesis so if if it was the case that it was an instance of cooperation or an instance of competition what are we expected to observe what's going to happen next so let's let's do the science and and we don't need to sign a blank check to defend the idea that any instance of plant intelligence has got to mean this or mean that because for one thing you, you this is interesting again connecting to the very beginning to the idea of plant blindness right uh, because because we have the idea that that plants are smart or plants are not uh, as if we could discuss that but if i if i ask you the the question are animals intelligent anyone the first thing they would say hey, who are you talking about is it the dolphin an elephant a fly an ant a turbine so what are we talking about before you come come up to terms as to what you want to respond so you might say but which animal are we talking about then i can tell you whether i think it's smart or not you see, in the case of plants, we don't do that. If I tell you, are plants intelligent? You might say yes or no, but you don't right. get to think, which plants are you talking about? Are you talking about an oak tree? Are you talking about a Arabidopsis? Are you talking about a daisy? So which plant are we talking about? And the fact that people don't raise this question is what tells me that we are not getting, we are still not getting it. Because if we if we got it, if we treated plants on the same footage as uh, uh, the same foot as, as animals, we could say, "Hey, hold on a sec. Which one are you telling me about? The weed in my garden, the rose, the oak tree?" So this means that once you get to think of the individual species, uh, actually not individual species, but the individuals. So this guy here, I'm talking about the smarts of this guy here, because remember, it's it's something that relates to the local environment. So this guy here might be doing something which is really dumb or something which is really smart, because it will depend on the necessities, on the needs, on the local interaction, what's happening out there. Then we can decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether this is an instance or this proves or shows intelligent behavior here and now. 
in the sense that you mentioned that this truly flexible goal oriented to be goal oriented we need we need to understand which the targets are such that their behavior can be oriented towards those goals those targets so again we cannot think of what's happening when inside the plant we need to think about each plant in particular provided the connection to the local environment in particular right and in the book you make this great point that it really matters if we're studying wild plants versus domesticated plants and absolutely that isn't something absolutely. that occurred yeah it occurred to me because you talk about kind of wild vines i mean imagine wild vines kind of clambering over each other in a jungle setting where there's this kind of rampant growth and actually yeah they really have to be there's going to be a lot of competition there driving forward evolution and and intelligence mm -hmm. versus i mean you know by analogy if you if you wanted to look at hunting behavior in a wild lion versus one that had been raised in a zoo if you take the one that's been raised in a zoo and you make it chase after something maybe it would fail and you go okay mm. this isn't this isn't a hunter it doesn't know how to do it but if you look yeah. at the wild lion suddenly you're seeing incredible intelligence there mm. um so yeah it'd be i'd love to give you some space just to kind of explain a bit about the methods and the kind of findings mm. that have, have been found because yeah. there's a lot to say because as you say like it's not about just saying okay we're going to put a generic plant under the microscope and, and see if it's intelligent yeah, yeah, yeah. because yeah. you have to look at different plants in different ways. Absolutely. Well, I, here there are two things. One is the, the type of observations you can make in the lab versus natural or ecological observations in the open. And that already constrains a lot of the behaviors that you can observe because, of course, the trade-off in between lab-based control and the observations of the behavior, of course, it has to do with the more control you have the more you risk mm, doing away with the behavior altogether because being so constrained in the lab the phenomenon might not occur so they might right. not be doing the things that they would in the wild like the sample of the lion in the cage or whatever right so so think what we've been doing to plants through domestication in the last ten thousand years i mean if it's a vine a climbing being as i explain in the book you know the ones with time lapse in my lab if it's a vine a climbing being Think that we've been for the last 10,000 years providing this support. Oh, how handy. Thank you so much. The pole nearby. I don't need to make any effort. I don't need to think, oh, the pole is always there. And we've been selecting, 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 selecting those seeds. And after 10,000 years, we have climbing beans that we have sculpted their phenotype for our needs. So we've treated those plants as objects, not as agents. Like, oh, very thank you so much oh what a beautiful fruit or uh, I, I can get from you or whatever uh, because because we've been thinking of the resources that they can pro furnish us with right now think of a vine in the wild right it's not just a matter it's not just a matter of of the what they need to do because there are so many so fierce competition as opposed to the one being spoiled in 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 your garden right it's just that they change their morphology completely. So, for example, a wild, a wild vine, the internode length, so the length in between nodes is way longer, so they stretch. The ones uh, that have been domesticated, in a sense, are kind of dwarf exemplars. So it, the, the distance in between nodes, the, the internode length shortens. This is not just a matter of aesthetics or a matter of, oh, the plant body, the morphology itself changed, is that it has a bearing, it has an implication upon the potential behaviors they can exhibit. So if you recall in the book uh, with Darwin, you can see to the naked eye a plant growing. Darwin called this the pattern of circumnutation, no? the plant circumnutates. So it's circling, it's growing in circles. Now, if that internode length shortens, it will revolve in circles differently because the center of mass is different, because the length is different. So if the plant body itself changes under gravity, under the constraint of gravity, as the plant grows, it might tilt, it might weigh or grow one way or another. And then that means that the pattern of circumnutation, the pattern of growth, elliptically or circularly, is going to change. And that implies that it's going to change the very way they search for information in their surroundings because they reach their goals through growth. If they grow differently because their body is different, they are going to reach their objectives differently, more or less successfully. 
right? So you see what I mean uh, by by sculpting their phenotype, we've changed their potential behaviors. And of course, some plants will be smarter than others. Uh, but if you think about it, it's not such big news. It's not really breaking news if we take seriously the non-metaphorical sense of plant sapiens as opposed to animal sapiens. The case of an animal in a cage or an animal in the wild is pretty obvious to anyone. But people don't stop to think, oh, domesticated plants under agriculture for the last 10,000 years is exactly the same, the same example. Right. Yeah. And the this idea of plant sapiens that they are gen, genuinely sapient and, and knowing, the, there's a way where you talk about some plants tracking the position of the sun. So even when it's cloudy, they'll kind of, you know, orient towards sure. it and kind of predict where the sun will rise as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, actually, that that was one of the first examples that 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 uh, caught my eye when I started to 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 to, to, to struggling to 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 deal with many counterexamples or, or you know philosophical arguments against the very possibility of plant intelligence. Um, the the most uh, uh, um, fearful responses were coming from people saying, "Hey, a plant." at best is able to exhibit online behavior. So like, like okay, I'm sun tracking, okay? Which means the sun is there, I'm tracking it online. So I don't need to represent the sun. I don't need to rely on any internal model of the sun or the trajectory of the sun because I'm latching onto it in real time. So your example is perfect because what happens when some object partially occludes it? So it's screened off. Or during the night, when the plant has to reorient its leaves to the position of next day's sunrise. So we have, we know of plants that not only track the sun while it's being screened off, uh, partially, temporarily, right? Uh, but also of plants that are able to reorient during the night and be ready, be ready to open their panels, their solar panels, right? Their leaves to do photosynthesis next day in the morning, right? So these are examples not of online cognition, as we said, but of offline cognition, which means that you are still competent, you are still tuning to picking up something from the environment despite being temporarily absent. So if that target is temporarily absent, either because there is some partial occlusion during the day or because you have to do something during the night to get to go back to day to square one, which means where is sunrise? I want to be ready next morning. Then those cases of offline intelligent behavior are to me the best cases where you can find a good reason to say, hey, they deal with their surroundings despite not being in constant contact with them. Thereby, they must be doing something real smart. And I think that idea, as you say, that I mean, presumably, pretty often the sun gets occluded if you're if you're growing in kind of thick vegetation. And given millions of years, it would be kind of astounding if they didn't evolve some way to represent the position of the sun. Because you know, something amazing about evolution is that it doesn't really matter how unlikely it is that um, you know things would come together in such a way as to allow an organism like me to function the way I do. It's more that the the niche, if it's given enough time, no matter how unlikely it is, eventually, if it's possible, it will happen, um, given enough time, that life will find a way to stumble on that, life will stumble on that mechanism, and it will succeed. And so it will be yeah. selected for. And so we know in us, it's possible to represent things, it's possible to, um, to have memories and to store information. And they have, they're working with the same kind of genetic and chemical electrical mm. toolkit. Mm. So it'd be kind of insane if they didn't come up with a similar Strategy. Yeah, yeah. Well, the best the best example here is circadian clocks. I mean, right. of course, most of these of these rhythmic patterns are circadian based, which is like all life ticks to the same clock, and that's the example of what you just mentioned. Because this, because there is no it, that's no surprise. Again, not just plants, fungi, bacteria, anyone, simply because we have all evolved under the same planetary rhythms like day-night cycles, 24 hours. So those things are extremely informative to any form of life on Earth. That's the clock we all tick to, right? Okay. And it's no surprise that molecularly speaking, we all share the same molecular clocks. So circadian clocks are the very same clocks we all share. Think of 
In fact, you know one, you know why uh, when people ask what's your favorite plant or species or family, I always say legumes, like legumes, like the uh, um, the climbing bean belongs to, because these 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 guys are uh, behave nictinastically, which is like they fold their leaves at night, and so the, their primary leaves so at night when the sun sets they fold them, and when in the morning they unfold them. So you so you can literally see them going to bed. Now, there are two intriguing things here. One is that they do it anticipatorily. So it's not that the lights go off or the sun sets and then they fold their leaves. No, it's that they anticipate the setting of the sun and they fold their leaves an hour ahead of time or whatever, it depends on the latitude and the conditions, the local conditions. But they anticipate sunset and fold them ahead of time. And they do the same to unfolding in the morning. So they say, hey, time to go to bed. Hey, time to wake up. So they do that anticipatorily. Of course, we know that's circadian based. But as you said, uh, that's because of that information pays off. So it could be stupid for any form of life not to rely on such regular cues. So yeah. it, it, that right. And the other issue is that that related to this idea of folding their leaves and going to bed. When people complain that, hey, now you are talking metaphors. I thought you you said you were you meant it literally. How can you say they go to bed, right? Well, they biosynthesize phytomelatonin. So melatonin, you know, the synthetic melatonin. Some people take as a pill to to allow them to go to bed to fall asleep. Uh, well, plants biosynthesize their own melatonin. It's the same molecule. So the same molecule, the same structure that animals secrete through their uh, pineal gland, in the case of plants, is of course not the pineal gland, but they still secrete it. So they biosynthesize their own melatonin. We are so stubborn, incredibly stubborn, that even when scientists in 1995, I'm talking, this is less than three decades ago, only 1995 it was discovered in plants. We knew about melatonin from the 50s and 60s in cattle, in, in, in sheep. Um, uh, but of course, it was an animal thing, right? Secreted, secreted by the pineal gland. Now say, so how? I mean, plants, of course. I mean, this is an animal thing. When, when they saw it through the microscope in 1995, they couldn't, scientists couldn't identified as melatonin because it was not expected to ha to, to be there. So if you're not expect that this is an amazing example in the philosophy of science. So if you are not expecting something, you don't get to see it. It's not part of your expectations. So it took a few years for the scientific community to agree upon the idea that what they were seeing through the microscope was truly melatonin. If only being so stubborn as we are, we decided to add the prefix phyto. So now it's called phytomelatonin, but it's the very same thing. So if you have legumes that fold their leaves before the sun sets, circadian based, biosynthesized melatonin, we know the effect melatonin has. And we still want to defend the idea that this is something we use metaphorically. What's the problem we have with nature? I mean, we don't realize that humans and non-human animals and the rest of the tree of life are in the very same business because day night cycles are informative to metabolic and physiological needs like dna repair legumes go to bed to repair their dna as we animals do yeah i think i think this points to the fact that we're still carrying around this kind of cartesian way of thinking where you know instead of realizing that we are nature that got up and kind of is, is walking around and in the, with the same kind of nature as plants. We may reluctantly admit that our bodies are nature, but we still feel like we're this self, this kind of transcendent thing yeah, that lives yeah. in the head. And so we can't help yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, so, mm. but this idea, I mean, there's this concept right of plant neurobiology, which is a kind of controversial term mm. pointing to what you're you're talking about, right? Because a lot of <clears throat> a lot of uh, neurotransmitters, chemicals found in the brain, right, are found in, uh, in plants sure. as well. Sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the example I gave you of, of phytomelatonin, the same goes for GABA, for glutamate, for all sorts of, of, of neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. So, that, I mean, if you go to the biochemistry, 
uh, in non-nervous systems, you find the very same things going on. Uh, because those things were already going on way before we could speak of animal or plant kingdom. And that's maybe the easiest way to put this all, which is one strategy to do away with this idea you just mentioned of we can't help but still stick into, you know, to our little little eye, little homunculi, right, at the wheel. Like, like still there's got to be something which is our own, you know, uh, that only belongs to us humans, right? And if you think about it in the history of science, it's been one defeat after another. From Ptolemeo to Copernico, to Darwin, to Watson right. and Crick. So if you think of the of the milestones in, in, in science, it's been one blow after another to our obsession with thinking that we are special. And we are not that special. We humans, I mean, in fact, the best way to put it is that life itself is what is special. So that's why, methodologically speaking, maybe the best strategy, instead of starting from the, from the top down and say, hey, this is us, human beings, whoa, how smart, let's see who else is smart. Maybe the easiest recipe to avoid those blows that history gives us every uh, regularly is to start from the bottom up. From the bottom up, from the very bottom, from the from the very basic primitive uh, uh, cellular life, and think because there you already find the idea, for example, of anesthetics uh, um, um, influencing uh, or altering the plasma membrane and, and, and altering the way ions are selectively um, uh, carried across the membrane of the cell, and thereby cancelling the possibility of the, the cell fi firing an action potential or transmitting electrical activity. So that's happening in life from square one. We just need, so if you do it from the bottom up, it's way easier because we can, we keep thinking, okay, this is the sort of toolkit we had uh, uh, billions of years ago. Okay, evolutionary, there is one thing in evolution which is conservative reason. So if things work, you don't jettison them. You don't do away with what works. So if those things were working then, it's not surprised that we have used them. Oh, they came handy, but not just to us. They came handy to any form of life whatsoever. So you will find GABA, glutamate, this or that all over the place simply because it did work to exploit electrical transmission of information together with chemical, with hydraulic in the case of the xylem pathways of trees. So all these informational channels are intertwined and deeply connected and in such a way that they allow the plant, the animal or the fungi or whichever form of life, multicellular or not, to orchestrate, to coordinate its global behavior. Because another thing that we miss uh, very often is that behavior it's something global. So it's got to be globally adaptive. So a plant is not responding to light like a robot. Oh, just like phototropism, I just grow towards light. No, they are responding to light and gravity and chemicals and neighbors and a whole, you know, panoply of parameters. So yeah, I think that's a great point that it's a kind of from from the first moment of life, they exist in a kind of multidimensional problem space that they have to solve in one go. They, they haven't got the luxury to say, oh, solve the light problem. And then, and oh, it happens in correlation with this other thing. It, it has Absolutely. to be. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so even in bacteria, chemotaxis, you think, oh, a bacteria is swimming right. up a chemical gradient. No, that's the toy version. Analytically, we need to dissect the problem to divide and conquer in the methodological sense to understand. So we need to make it simple. but. It's not swimming up a, a chemical gradient, the bacteria. It's swimming up a chemical gradient in the context of gravity and this and that and that right. and that. So it's, uh, as you said, from the very beginning is the whole thing altogether. That's the way, the best way to, to start building from the bottom up. Right, and probably also monitoring other things that we wouldn't expect just in case that, that you know, who knows if the niche is gonna change in the environment, there might be new correlations that emerge that they could exploit. And so, yeah, I think this this whole picture of life not being able to just live in a in a neat little bundle of reflexes like a little toy is really mm. more accurate um but so on this idea of plant neurobiology and electrical signaling i mean plants do signal electrically right like brains do and sure. i wonder if you could describe 
what the, the kind of phyto nervous system would be in, in kind of parallel to an animal nervous system. Do you write about yeah. the kind of vascular bundles? Sure. Well, uh, well, first thing is that is that I wish I could describe, which means the progress. So we already know a lot, but there is way more to be uh, unearthed, right? So, so, so that's another way to say that this is an exciting field of research, and and everything is still up for grabs, right? Um, yeah, but yeah, basically the, the the basic analogy holds in place. So when people complain about the label plant neurobiology, I'm not obsessed, obsessed with labels. I don't care if they want to change the term, so be it. As long as they understand the analogy and how it, what sort of role it plays. So when we say that plants' uh, information processing networks are similar to animal nervous systems, we mean to say that they are functionally similar, right? So, of course, plants have no neurons and there is no nervous system, but their phytosystem, we call it phytonervous system, there is a book by J.C. Bose, an Indian polymath from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, 1925 or 26, 1926, the nervous system of plants, it was called the book. And in fact, in a few years is the 100th anniversary. Um, and, 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 and basically this, the, the very idea uh, still holds in place, which is that uh, plants need, to, so if you think of the vascular system of higher plants, higher plants, the ones with the vascular system, right? So if you think of the vascular system of a higher plant consisting of, of these, these tubes of, of xylem and phloem, right? So the xylem and the phloem are thought of like the, Freeways or the motorways for the translocation of substances like the sugars, the minerals, the water going up and down the xylem and flowing pathways, right? Um, that's another way to say that we are still having a physiological close up look to the plant body system. But if we treat it not as a system for the physiological translocation of substances, but a system for the processing of information, then a whole picture emerges. Because what you see is that the plant is interconnecting the whole vascular system through the transmission of electrical signals. And then here what you have is signals that take the form of action potentials. And here, this is the best example of something which is non-metaphorical but literal. We just published a paper on this, on, 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 on the potential, we call it the potential of plant action potentials. <laughs> and why is called that? Because action potentials, if, if uh, the listeners familiar uh, with, the, with the basics, you have like a threefold profile, electro electrophysiological profile, has, it's like a little peak, like it depolarizes, then repolarizes, then hyperpolarizes, right? So this threefold picture, this, Spiking, no, is is the cell, the neuronal cell or non-neuronal cell spikes, uh, uh, fires spikes of voltage, right? So this in plant cells happens exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the values of the potential. So the resting potential is not like minus seventy millivolts, like in the neuronal cell, it could be like minus two hundred. But it simply has to do with a different amount of charges, particle, right. charge particles in and outside the cell, right? But the basic principle holds in place that you have a resting potential, which is a difference in voltage in between the inside and the outside of the cell. And then some stimulus happens, some, something triggers a depolarization. There is an exchange of ions in between the inner and the, and, and the outer part. And eventually the cell repolarizes and then after a period in which it cannot fire anymore, it just go back to normal and it's ready for the next, the next spike, right? So that's the very same thing. It just changes the scales in millivolts and the scales, of course, the time scale. The time scale is different. They do it slower, right? But on top of action potentials, plants have what is called variation potentials, um, which transmit locally and are graded, are not all or nothing like action potentials. So action potentials in plants are like animal action potentials. They are all or nothing. Variation potentials are graded, right? So they are uh, uh, continuous with, with uh, uh, proportional to the amount of the stimulus. Then you have systems potentials. 
So this is another way to say that we have many, many, many different types of electrical signals. Some of them are identical to the animal ones. And on top of those, they have a different repertoire. They have different ways of conveying information by electrical means. So all in all, all this gives you a whole picture of the different ways in which plants can communicate, can pass along messages throughout the vascular system, right? Yeah. Now, just, just one... Yeah, now one, just one point, because this is important uh, to understand that they need to do so because when we said that plants respond globally and not locally, we need to understand how they are integrating the whole plant body. So if a plant is growing a, a branch, a tree is growing a branch or a plant is growing a, a shoot this way, they will they will compensate by growing in such and such a way the root structure. So that they have to transmit that information from root to shoot. They need to know who is doing what to decide what to do next at the level of the whole plant body. So the, the roots will go will grow differently depending on how the branches or the or the shoots are doing. So all this is orchestrated, coordinated, in part through electrophysiological means. Right, and all of this is being harnessed, you know. I mean, what we're talking about here is the potential substrate for the kind of intelligent behavior you've been talking about. And one of the more famous studies is Monaco Gagliano's work on peas and cascal conditioning. I wonder if you yeah. could uh, quickly describe that. Well, uh, that's um, um, that's a red herring, I have to say, because it's an experiment we've been trying to replicate for the last two and a half years in my lab. That's why I wanted to raise it. So you mentioned that you've not been able to replicate it. Right, right, right. So we are still working on it. Now we have a, a report, uh, like a, um, 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 direct replication of 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 Monica Galliano's and colleagues' uh, results, and we are in the process of finishing the the study. Now. Um, all I can say for the time being, because it wouldn't be uh, responsible for me to to advance results, which is still, this is science, so we still don't know. We still have to gather the data right. and, and analyze it. But the preliminary um, results that we have uh, point in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. That is to say, that is to say, we have identified a considerable number of flaws in the experimental design. Now, why I say this? Because it's got to be. It's, it, this is important to understand that one thing is to identify flaws in the experimental design, so to speak. Simply say, "Hey, this design doesn't work." And a different issue is to say that there is no plant learning or plant learning by association. Yeah. Now, think of associative learning. What it means. So, just people will have in mind the idea of Pavlov's dog, right? So you can associate two stimuli, right? So the dog would naturally salivate in the presence of food, and they wouldn't if you just ring a bell. By pairing the bell and the food a number of times, the dog learns that the bell means food, and it will salivate prior to the appearance of the food, right? So this pairing of the stimuli, the condition and the unconditioned stimuli, is the very same rationale, the very same example, the protocol that uh, Galeano used in her experiment. Now, so the problem is not with that. Uh, that's okay. Actually, that's what we want to focus on in the next few years. We want to work on this uh, on this paradigm. Um, the problem is that people who have read that paper will see that they weren't, for example, doing time lapse. So they were growing this pea plant within a Y maze, an opaque Y maze. And on one arm of the Y maze and on the other, they would put the stimuli, like the light, which means food, right? The blue light is like the food for the plant, the equivalent to the food for the dog. And instead of salivating, the equivalent in the behavioral output would be the growth towards. So they would grow towards food, right? And the other uh, um, stimuli, the, the neutral stimuli, uh, equivalent to the to the bell they could ring was a fan to produce an airflow because the plant by nature wouldn't naturally it wouldn't grow towards the source of the airflow whereas it would grow naturally towards blue light so by pairing airflow and blue light they would expect that the plant would end up growing towards the airflow expecting that blue light 
that this food would come next, right? So that's basically the experiment. Now, we've been working on this for the last two and a half years, as I said, and we have been bumping onto a hurdle after another. And to me, what's more intriguing about this example is that is the type of hurdles that we bump onto when you get to do it. So it's something you don't realize, you don't notice if you're, for example, a reviewer for a journal. So if you're a reviewer and you're reading the submission, you don't see that. Right. Then the paper gets published. <laughs> if you do it, this is only something you spot when you are doing hands-on work. And we've been going through detailed and details, problems after problem with this uh, paradigm. And we see that there are many, many problems. One problem is starting to start with is this is pretty obvious is that to observe behavior you need to observe it so if you're going to do a behavioral study if you are doing a behavioral study you need to observe the behavior somehow right well if the y maze the pea plant was growing into is opaque you cannot observe behavior so we needed to do transparent 3d printed y mazes use infrared cams so that we could time lapse in pitch dark while the plants were growing in the maze as we were uh, providing the stimuli and not just checking out on the test day which arm the plant grew into right uh, so many many other problems but but those problems are in the literature we are publishing that material that's something uh, if somebody's interested they can just drop me a line and I can explain, but for the time being, to me, what's really important, the message to get through is that the fact that one experimental design is flawed doesn't mean that there are theoretical good reasons to pursue that idea. So I okay. still think that it makes a lot of sense to conjecture, to conjecture. This is a working hypothesis that plants might be able to learn to make associations in between neutral and unconditioned cues, right? Simply because, as we said, the world is full of contingencies, unexpected things might happen, and things don't work clockwork. So you might need to say, hey, associate things to precisely right. behave anticipatorily, right? So if plants were able to do that, I wouldn't be surprised at all. In fact, I would be surprised they were not able to do that. And that's why I plan to keep researching in this line for the next years. Now, all we are saying is that to address that question, to come to terms and find out scientifically whether plants are able to learn by association, this design, this experimental design in particular, is not able to throw any light. Okay, that's, I'm glad to hear you're going to be pursuing that, though. I uh, look forward to reading that. So maybe mm -hmm. to, to end on, I think we both agree that the, for the same reasons that we've, we've been laying out, this extends beyond intelligence and to subjectivity, to consciousness, to experience, and the plants yeah. you know, feel themselves in the world you know, as, as we do, not in the same. The experience wouldn't be the same, but that there's mm -hmm. some, the lights are on. Um, and this raises interesting questions around kind of plant suffering that you explain kind of explored towards the end of the book. And so I wonder if, you know, my instinct is if someone mows their grass, the, mm -hmm. it seems to me that the, the experience is bound up, you know, I think you might agree with, with the embodied action, with the coupling of the organism to the environment. And so I suffer when there's something I can do to escape that suffering. So if I'm too hot and I can physically move to put myself into a colder place or take off some, a jumper or something, you know, I'll suffer because I precisely because I have an ability to to kind of move away from that state. But if someone was to inject me with, with or like would if someone were to kind of artificially slow my heart, I wouldn't actually suffer, even though I would die because I've not evolved to kind of have a capacity to to respond to that. So I, I feel like the my instinct is if you were to mow the grass, the grass that you cut wouldn't be hurt. But you write in the book about how they release organic these volatile organic compounds that other um, cause kind of responses or might stress out other mm. um, grass or, around it. So my my impression of that picture would be that the grass you cut doesn't get hurt because it, you know, it's 
it no, it's um, it's not evolved to to move away from being eaten or, or cut, but that perhaps there would be a kind of um, in the same way that we feel stress when we're propelled to move into a different state, mm-hmm. then maybe mm-hmm. the the grass around would feel some subjectively mm-hmm. negative state. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, there is no, yeah, that, those are perfectly sound points. I mean, uh, and it's not, one thing is for sure, that this is not an easy, an easy uh, question. Um, I don't, I don't have a definite answer uh, that goes right. without saying. Uh, but one thing is for sure, we, we do need to bear in mind that uh, we can tell apart your right in between stress and suffering. You might uh, be stressed. You don't need to suffer. Um, um, and then there is the basic sense of awareness. So we are, if there is some subjective sense of awareness, however basic or simple it is, we can still again go back to the stamp of the tree of life. And awareness somehow belongs to life. So where there is life, there is awareness in a basic sense. And if there is awareness in a basic sense, Awareness comes with a sense of a valence. So, so there is a valence to be uh, uh, stuck on, onto, on, onto whatever is being felt, right? This is good or bad. Uh, I feel stressed or not because, because that's the way you have to integrate all those informational channels to say, hey, I need to do something about it. This is bad news. This is good news, right? Um, now, how much of that translates into actual explicit forms of suffering as we know of and that's a really red herring we might never have an answer uh, uh, but to me to me the answer uh, mm, the cautious answer is twofold first as you know from the book you know if you think of the epilogue we end up not with ethics but with education um, and I think we have to bring in education to discuss ethics because education is not something that happens uh, in an explicit format, or I don't think it should. So it's not like, okay, you know, you, you give me the syllabus. I learn it by heart, and then I know what to do with these forms of life. And then it's sort of like a basic, these, these, these instructions, right? Okay, this, this form of life suffers. Tell me how to deal with it, how to interact with it. This other, so it's not like that, I think. Uh, it's more like, uh, in fact, we use the example of the of the film in the book, right? The My Octopus Teacher, right? So if if, if listeners who are familiar with who have watched the 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 film, uh, My Octopus Teacher, they to me what I felt when I watched it is that I was getting something that that I would have never got from a textbook, which is some direct sense of 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 empathy and awareness of what is it like to be somebody else really radically different from me right that's you know that one of the book chapters is called what is it like to be a plant and that's part of that exercise we need to do so if we do that exercise however far stretch it is so i know they are way more dissimilar than fellow uh, primates or mammals or whatever and then there is a leap of imagination, that's for sure. But a leap, not of faith, a leap in, in the science that needs to be done. So I think it can be tackled scientifically, the issue of what is it like to be some other life form. Now, if we don't have the resources of the means as of today to flag which forms of life do suffer as opposed to which form of life are simply mildly stressed or whatever, if we still don't have the resources to tell in between those two possibilities, to me, the easiest response is to say, hey, first, don't go nuts about it. I mean, we don't need to change the way we live. We might just need to reconsider some aspects such as, well, in your daily routine, you try not to inflict damage unnecessarily, right? I mean, why? You wouldn't do it for free. You you inflict some damage when it's absolutely necessary, when when you couldn't have done otherwise. You see? Um, um, if that's the rule that moves us, I think I think we have more work done than we think. 
because this doesn't draw a dividing line in between, for example, dietary requirements. So, you know, like when I give talks on plant intelligence, many right. people go like, hey, now what? I'm a vegan, now what? Right? And then I always say, no, no, hold on a sec. This is not the good and the bad guys. This is not like there is a dietary choice which is correct and another one that is incorrect by default. The assumption that plants are intelligent and what this brings, ethically speaking, has to do with any choice we make whatsoever. And they are all on an equal holding because you might find that some crop has been stressed unnecessarily until you pick the fruit. Say in intensive agriculture, in greenhouses, with artificial lighting, with chemicals like, you know, crops on asteroids, if you see what I mean. And you might have a chicken in a farm, organically raised and having a great life, of course. So you might have different organisms from different kingdoms, plant or animal, that might be more or less stressed throughout their lives, more or less necessarily or unnecessarily before they both get to your plate. And that's another way to say that we can do two things. First, to respect everybody's choices and to realize that the problems are everywhere, that there is not any easy solution coming from a way that we classify and divide, categorize uh, choices. Yeah, that's really interesting. It makes me feel that the uh, the main axis is where there is kind of a natural unfolding allowed to arise where there's kind of, you know, in this analogy, free range chickens, organic agriculture, you can assume there's kind of minimal stress where, where organisms have the ability to find their right balance and where mm. there is control, aggressive kind of forcing things to be a certain way, there is stress and potentially suffering. Um, and so I think, mm. yeah, that, I mean, that's true of humans as well. So I think, I think that's a, a really interesting uh, mm. lens to look at this through. Well, thank you so much, Becca. This has been really great. And so the book is Plantar Sapiens, which is out now. Um, is there anywhere else you would send people to if they want to look into your work? Well, they could just go to the Minimal Intelligence Lab. That's the Mint Lab. So the Minimal Intelligence Lab webpage, we have all the information both about the book and about the activities and research we do at the, at the lab. So you're welcome to, to visit us. Great. And thanks again. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.